Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. How is everyone doing? I can't believe it is 12th week. We are on the last session for BESA program. And I, we appreciate your time and energy you invest into this. So really happy to be with you. We are not ending the series in the sense like BESA program would continue. Only this batch would end today, but we would be coming up with more ideas. And obviously we need suggestions from you so that uh, we could make this better and give you the most return on the investment of time and energy you do with our program. So I hope everyone is here. If you could let us know that uh, how you are today, just just anything good, bad, excited, energetic, or maybe looking to do something exciting, feel free to share. And then we will quickly get started with today's session. All right. I'll, I'll tell about my things. I, I had to do a lot of shoppings today. I'm having a list of things to shop, not like fancy stuff, but they're mostly household groceries and all. So yeah, I would be investing some time there. And I have a DIY project, which I was delaying from long, long time. So I would finish this time today. So that's hopefully this is my plan. How about others, anyone? So Puran is here. Thank you, Puran. So we will, talk about lots of stuff today that will be starting with this discussion on uh, how to uh, hack the job hunt uh, so we'll talk about that and then jamila and gesep will talk about the uh, startup ecosystem of aws and how aws supports startup so so we will talk about lots of stuff so let me add today's guest who is liz liz i'm adding you to the stream hello hello hi, hi. Hi, Liz. What time is it there? <laughs> it's 1 a.m. in the morning. It's wow. nice. and When you say good morning, you're saying good morning. Um, but it's OK. I'm a night owl. As I said, I've, I've been traveling so much. Just got back from Australia. So I'm wide awake and ready to chat. Nice. Thank you so much for your time. Now, I was checking your profile. You've been into like Australia. You worked in Indonesia, Netherlands, US. What else? And how come? <laughs> yeah. Well, my dream was always to work in talent. I love people. I love the puzzle of people's careers. So that's what I like to solve. And my dream was always to work in every country in the world. I didn't quite get there. <laughs> but I have looked at, across every continent. Uh, my passion was emerging market talent challenges, so hiring into emerging markets like Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Eastern Europe, the BRIC countries. So, yeah, that was my passion. Nice. And any any specific country which you like the most or there is no like top or bottom list? No. Uh, they're all fun. I mean, it's I loved being in Indonesia. That was crazy. You know, mm -hmm. I knew I was in for it when I arrived at the airport and it took five hours in Banjir. Banjir is floods in a traffic jam. And I thought if I can survive this, I can survive anything. So that was crazy. <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, so yeah, there's like a lot of traffic jams and like Asian countries are somehow a little bit of challenging in terms of traffic. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's an interesting experience, I would say. Yeah. Good. And any specific place in Indonesia, like Bali, like that is most common place? Yeah. I, well, actually, I like the uncommon places like the Gili Islands or, you know, they've got some beautiful like the Komodo Islands go a bit further afield. It's got great diving. I'm passionate about scuba diving. But, you know, I, I was pulled there by work because it was a key market for us when I was working for Philip. So. Nice, good, thank you. So, so I, I got your slide deck. I, I'll present these slide decks and I'll let you then take over. So I'll, I'll be here, but yeah, I'll, I'll ask questions in between and we can have like maybe a question and answer session at the end. And Sounds right. good. Audience, uh, keep your questions coming. Liz is very, very uh, experienced recruiter. She's been working into different fields. She manages lots of things in AWS. She's team lead for uh, sales team. So for recruitment, so so please leverage all the experience she has, and she is so. Uh, uh, means I would say it's like so humble to have you here at one o'clock. Means it's a really really appreciated. Thank you so much. I'll add you into the screen now. Excellent. So we have a hacking the job hunt 
slides for you today. And you can go into my next slide already. A uh, little bit of an overview of what we're going to cover. The three key things that I think you need to be aware of when you're going into the job hunt. And we'll start with that um, networking piece. Can I, can I stop you for a minute? Would you sure. mind introducing introducing yourself? Like what what you do on AWS, so that we have a context on like what this train is all about. Yeah, I will. Um, I'm. That's the next slide after this one. So, I'll. I'm gonna give you an overview of what we're gonna do today. Um, first, and then I'll introduce a bit about me. And sure. so, what we're gonna do today is really hack the job hunt, right? So three basic components of hacking the job hunt, which is the first piece is around the networking piece, which we always forget. We always think it's about submitting CVs, but the most important thing you can do is really network your way into a job. Um, then it, it, it is also about your resume basics and your profile and how to stand out and how to really articulate your value proposition to the market. And we'll also talk a little bit about how to polish up your interview style. So they're the kind of three core critical things you need to get good at doing. Um, so that's what we're going to do. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And they're the kind of questions that I want to hear from you. And if we go to the next slide, I'll tell you a bit, bit more about me. Yeah. So as um, mentioned, I'm actually um, the global POC for worldwide commercial sales which is our main sort of customer facing business, it's about 67% of AWS revenue globally. And we primarily hire sales and solution architects. So that's our core um, hiring area. Prior to that, I worked at a company called DSM, where I was in a global head of talent role, where I hired a lot of engineers and um, tech and science folks. And then I was at Google. Um, prior to that, I was tasked with um, setting up the next billion users software engineering team in Singapore and Asia, which was super fun. And as I mentioned, when um, I first started, my specialty is emerging markets all around the world and how you can tailor your brand uh, for any job, any market, any time. So let's kick into our first topic, right? Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about your personal brand um, uh, as you, you go on LinkedIn, uh, because this is something that um, we don't spend a lot of time. And I'm just going to give some basics to start off. And then if you have deeper questions, we'll dive into those. So the first thing is your professional headshot. I actually use my badge photo from Amazon from for LinkedIn because that's what I was guided to do. And I think it works perfect, simple, straightforward. I still see a lot of shadow sunglasses, uh, photos at weddings. I think that's a distraction from you and your brand. So keep it simple with just a professional straight on photo. Um, the most important thing that I would get you to do straight away if I was working with you is customize your headline. When a recruiter and often now hiring managers are searching on LinkedIn or through social media, they're not seeing your full LinkedIn when they first, um, they're seeing a long list and they're seeing a very small tile of your LinkedIn. So put yourself in the shoes of that, that hiring team of what they're actually seeing. So they're seeing a tile with your photo, your name, maybe a location and what we call your headline. And often your headline will default to whatever your most recent job title is, but you have the ability to customize that with very tailored world. So my headline will be global talent acquisition leader because that's how I choose to present myself. Simple, honest, straightforward, uh, but you could use some keywords there. You could really start to highlight the specific technologies or um, areas like FSI or verticals that, that you want to work in. So this is the, the most important line on your LinkedIn profile. Um, if you actually go to the next slide, you can see I've already summarized all this list right um, with you. And the way in which LinkedIn search works from a recruiter's perspective is it works entirely on Boolean strings or keywords. So your keywords are critical. 
if you're not being very specific about what you're putting on your profile, you're not going to be findable. And, and your job, first and foremost, is to make yourself easy to search, easy to find. And when we see that tile, we want to go straight into, does this person have the key core qualifying criteria for what I'm seeking? Um, and then when we actually get into your real LinkedIn profile, again, I think sometimes people forget the most important thing, which is be data driven. And both in your CV and your LinkedIn profile, it should match. So one of the things that they'll be looking for is if your CV is really detailed and your LinkedIn is very sparse, then that might be, well, why don't we see the sort of the data or the information on the CV reflected on your public profile? Um, so you want to make sure that they are aligned, connected, have the same job titles, the same dates. Um, and we still see people just not spending the time on that profile to make sure uh, that it has those data-driven achievements. And the best thing is what I learned at Google, which is you just keep it super simple. Achieved X impact with Y actions. You know, really simple. Achieved what did I achieve? What did I deliver? What value did I bring in my learn and be curious projects or experiments or even the cool things that I've done in my spare time? What, what sort of value does that bring to a user or a customer? And, and, and very high level action statements on how you got there um, with, with your data-driven statements that will really make your profile stand out and be exciting to hiring teams. So the best thing about LinkedIn as well is you can really showcase your achievements. So I'm going to ask you to go to the next slide because I'm going to give you an example of a solution architect whose profile I really like. And I think it just will show you a little bit of what I'm meaning. So this is Ashmit Kara. She's in Sydney, my hometown. Um, here, you know, we can see her headline statement, it's just senior solutions architect at Amazon. So it's super simple. In her about statement, look, it is a long statement that you can see here. And there's, you know, different perspectives on should it be short and sharp and sweet, but it's super filled with keywords and data, action oriented, results driven business, 14 years experience really shows me the segments and verticals of customers this person's interested or experienced with. And then it shows me all the technologies. So this person is going to hit all the keywords that I'm searching for or the hiring manager is searching for. Um, now, obviously, this person <laughs> maybe has many more years experience, but that doesn't mean in your about keywords, you can't use targeted information of what you're aiming to do. But the other great thing about this person is, as you can see to the right side of the slide, they've really used that active multimedia. Um, so they've got work product for me to go in and click on and maybe get a sense of how this person presents um, to audiences. And when we're thinking about a solution architect, we're thinking about someone who's extremely tech savvy has broad and deep technical skill sets in multiple areas. I want to look at their verticals, segments, you know, like retail, finance, et cetera. But um, I also want to see, do they, can they be a thought leader? And so this person is really positioning themselves as a thought leader to me. They've got this background of them presenting at reInvent, engaging our customers at our most important meeting. Um, so. I'm also looking for that business savvy that they understand how to work backwards from our customers and tailor solutions and, and articulate things in a way that any customer can absorb and understand. So I've got some great links that I can click on. I've got work product I can dive into. I might even have some cross links to GitHub where I can cross reference their tech projects with their customer interfacing interaction capability. So that's just a first little step around building your brand. The next slide 
is really around how you then network yourself. So Let's I'm sure you have a question yeah, here. Yeah. So, so that it will be like, so we, we talked about that there is a difference between buzzword and keywords. So, yeah. so little, little idea on that, like how, how you differentiate it. Yeah, I, I think a buzzword is something that might be popular and seems really important. So like, you know, like we have a lot of buzzwords like um, problem solving, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, collaborative, and, and, and everyone has them. You're going to have them. But sometimes what they add up to is something that isn't what you're going to be searching, right? Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. uh, and it also seems to lose meaning. What does collaborative meaning? We see it on every CV. So in after a while, there's no data around it. I can't quantify it. So the keywords are really going to be pushing those heavier skills that are more quantifiable, like your tech, like your verticals, where they instantly have a meaning and they're the kind of words that I'm going to be using in a search string. Um, when I'm looking, when I'm sourcing on LinkedIn, when I'm sourcing the net, when I'm trying to X-ray GitHub, I'm trying to find certain um, words and they have instant meaning. So I think really what that's saying is put yourself in the shoes of the person's, person that's searching. And if you look at the word choice on your profile, have you chosen words that they're going to be entering into their Boolean search string? Makes sense. And I I want to like take another question, which is like, sure. uh, it, it's going back a little bit on before even you, let's say somebody is coming to their LinkedIn profile, like, and and mm -hmm. just use this like a uh, very basic information, nothing Amazon specific. How a recruiter start searching for candidates? So let's say you got a job profile or you got a requisition from a hiring manager. What what is your next step as a recruiter? So so we want to get an idea on that. Oh right, okay. Okay, it's quite in depth, so let me summarize it for you. So we're gonna have a detailed briefing in most cases to just revisit this job description with a hiring manager. And we're gonna extrapolate what is the sort of ideal profile? What, are, what does someone need to be doing to be working with X customer in FSI or SMB? Um, what are the type of technologies they most need to be across? Uh, what is critical versus nice to have. Mm -hmm. And from that, we're going to build what we call search strings or Boolean operators. And uh, old school recruiters like me love to do that. And then X-Ray, Google and other. So we'll do in URL searches for LinkedIn and a range of um, web sources will basically scrape the web with search strings that have operators like and, or, either or that kind of can open up the talent pipeline or close it down. Um, so we're going to enter those search strings either directly into LinkedIn. LinkedIn makes it super easy now. So it's just like ticking boxes, but you can still sort of what I call X-ray the whole web so that you bring up a diverse search. And, and so when they search, they're going to build lists. And as I said, so if it's LinkedIn, which is, a primary um, area, it's going to look like you're just going to have pages and pages of people that come up in that search. And so you're just going to see very small, what I call tiles of candidate and wanting to be, and, and that's where your headline, your photo, and some of your key information can make a key difference in sort of wanting that recruiter to deep dive into your profile. Yeah. And is there like a filtering system which LinkedIn applies automatically? Like, hey, this person was very active, so let's put him or her on the top of your keyword search or any other criteria are there, if you are aware. I'll stack rank the person to ha who has the most of match, you know, bing, ding, 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 matching those keywords. It, it, it won't necessarily be activity. Uh, but what's really interesting to me is as a recruiter, we just go more and more in depth. So before it used to be just very static, looking at what they've done, where they've been, and that's still the core. But now I'll go and look, even now I'll be looking at their posts, I'll be looking at their comments, I'll be looking at their interactions because we're looking for thought leadership. Makes sense. 
And do you pay attention to on LinkedIn? There is a setting which says open to work. Do you mind that or how how <laughs> recruiter takes that? Yeah, the big open to work debate. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I, from our perspective, from you know, this is it's very personal and subjective. And I feel for job seekers because you hear very opinionated recruiters tell you things. And of course, we're, it's very subjective. Um, from an Amazon perspective, we love it. It just makes our job so much easier. It's like putting a big alert sign. There's literally no judgment saying open to work that I think people have said they're worried of being stigmatized by it. Nope. Why would we? Um, many, many top talented, amazing people have been laid off in the last um, eight months in tech and, and are putting that open to work banner. We're just trying to find people. So if you can make yourself stand up, why not? stand out why not yeah makes sense thank you uh let me add you back to the stream i'll, I'll so, sorry if i'm interrupting your thought process but yeah, please that, uh, i uh, love uh, an interruption this is my it's kind of the family dinner table at the Mackay household as people interrupting each other and talking over the top of each other so i love it yeah. i i really have one more sort of key point here which was um if we go forward in the slides um which is about once we've kind of done this this is the other thing certifications are huge right this is a key thing this is where tech recruiters are going to really dive into the details and of course we love aws certifications because we understand them and we understand what they map back to um so the the future is really about skills um upskilling micro credentialing so we're really big on focused on your focusing on your skills. So I would spend time ticking those boxes. And I personally, subjective recruiter talk here, love recommendations. And I love looking at how many have been given versus received. And I, I really think you can sense the genuineness of a recommendation. And this is where we come into you can tell as a recruiter whether someone's given it just willingly because they really appreciated the work of that individual or whether they've kind of done it um, because the person sort of said, please, please. You can tell that, that, that whether they're really giving that endorsement to that individual. Um, so we're looking for those genuine, authentic endorsements and, and really looking at the qualitative nature of what that person provided the value they they gave to the business the customer the end user um, so that's a, a, a big tip um, of course recruiters don't have a lot of time so some might just get to those headlines and those keywords in the summary um, but um, as you go through the process um, it's not just about that first contact a recruiter makes they'll come back to this and keep deep diving and the more you go through the process of an interview and a hiring uh, situation, they'll be looking at all of these things and discussing them with the hiring manager. Um, so once we've really got this, we can move on and say, okay, we've really looked at our profile, we've pimped our profile, we're ready for the market, what next? The most important thing you can do is think about your script. What's your reach out? Um, you can't just apply to a job these days, you have to be engaging. So you want to ideally reach out to the hiring manager perhaps on LinkedIn and have a conversation. Um, so one of the things I see is, is, is very direct reach outs where it's just like, get me a job. Um, and I would just encourage you to think when you're scripting the, how you reach out, make sure you're getting the name right. I often get people asking me for a job at another company or getting my name wrong. Um, or being very direct rather than thinking how can i put myself in the shoes of this recruiter or hiring manager what problem are they trying to solve and how can i help them solve that problem and if you just do a basic search on linkedin there's some really great examples of of different scripts that people use that that catch the eye and get attention um, so you really want to be thinking how do i actually build a relationship with the people i'm trying to get hiring me rather than have it be transactional and just spamming their inbox, right? So that's a, a really important component of the job search and the job hunt.
I'm just going to pause there and see if there are any questions about networking and branding before we move on to the next section. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a question from the uh, audience. So there is a question mm -hmm. which is like not branding specific, but you are talking about like, hey, do you have an example of what a recruiter sees in LinkedIn when browsing profile? So you already answered like there would be tiles and all, but any other information which is visible there? Um, I don't, I, I wasn't able to share with you, but let me, what I like to do when I'm working with someone individually is I'll go and show them my screen, but I can't do that today. And I'll show them what we see, um, when we're doing a search, but it, it, in the initial phase, it's probably just going to be that name location. And I'm going to see some, and I'm going to see that, that statement that I mentioned, they're sort of your your main statement to the world about who you are and then the tire will run out of room and I might see a grab of the experience and a grab of education and the other thing as I said I'll see spotlights so the first thing I'll see is that open to work or um do they um are they a company follower of AWS mm -hmm. so it, or and obviously a recruiter at Google will say, I'm, "Are you a company follower at Google?" So little spotlights will will pop up. Um, uh, like also, are they a first connection or a second connection, and and who they know? So there's like little um, teaser information um, that I can see. And and as I said, I'm just doing a search now to to kind of refresh. And there's like I just saw someone they've got you know solution architect no photo. And there's not necessarily a complete watch out, but I just think it's nice to have that professional photo, right? Um, and I'll be honest, my my eye is drawn to those open to work banners. <laughs> and taking a step back, Liz, like, so let's say uh, you, you start your search from internal system because internally there is a huge database of people who applied or do yeah. you start directly on LinkedIn or every, it depends on recruiter? such a good question um it's it really depends on the context of the situation and where we're at so um what i would say is generally recruiters are always searching <laughs> so we're always we, we most companies have teams that are sourcing searching 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 and then we have teams that are managing the hiring manager the hiring team setting up interviews so they work in partnership but there are others, obviously some teams that just have end-to-end -end recruiters that are doing all of it. So they're always skipping around it. From an Amazon perspective, I can tell you we have a great, what we call CRM or database that we have pools of candidates that we've already engaged with. So we'll absolutely search there. At the moment, we're absolutely going to be looking at internal talent for sure. Um, it, but it, it just depends on the circumstances. Sometimes a hiring manager might say, I know no one in the internal immediate environment has this skill set. So you're probably likely going to go more external at this time. Or they're going to go, I just want the best person, which means whoever is the best for this job internally, externally, I just want to do a, a conjoined search. So we'll do both simultaneously and just try to get the best people in front of that manager. Okay, nice. And sorry, I'm asking too many questions. So Fine. I have another question. Like, let's say you filtered out 10 candidates. So do you reach out to them directly or you first run them through the hiring manager? Okay, that's another really good question. And again, it depends, right? So solution architecture, you know, is a very well-known <laughs> role to us, right? So typically we, we have very experienced recruiters who know what to look for and they'll just go straight away and reach out. But there are certain, you know, we might have a role. We have a really exciting role right now that is for Coupang, which is an amazing Korean customer. And um, it's that we're, we're hiring a solution architect for them based in Seattle, even though it, it's a Korean based organization. So that's something where it's quite unique and specific. So we might think, hey, I'll run this by the hiring manager. And hey, do you think this profile is that sort of, hitting what you need and we want to talk to the hiring manager and say well why didn't it like was there 
oh, they didn't have this skill or, oh, okay, so that's really more important to you. You might have said to me, it's a nice to have, but actually it's now looking like more of a must have. So what we're doing is we're calibrating the type of profile that this role and the customer needs to have, um, particularly in my space, because it's very customer focused solution architecture. Um, so we're really calibrating that as we go. And or if it's a newly created role that we possibly haven't hired before, that's where we might double, triple check before we reach out. And in some cases, you know, these solution architects are in demand. So we might actually ask the hiring manager to reach out instead of us because they might actually connect better. So we're, we've got a little pack for that where they can automatically reach out and book time on the hiring manager's calendar to have what we call a coffee chat, like right? just, you know, just to sort of test the water. This is interesting. I was not aware about that. I thought yeah. every time I would be hearing from recruiter, but yeah, good to know. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we get them involved because, you know, they might um, be able to engage with you in a, in a different yeah. way on a work level. Get your point. Yeah, I, and I, we know sometimes tech people get frustrated with recruiter reach outs, especially if they're bad. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Some no, of them. So that is a perception of someone, but no, I I don't think so. That everyone is having a specific job to perform, and obviously, the recruiter plays an important role in that. So why not? Okay, so I think we need to just move this along. So let's, uh, if you can help me out here, Scott. Yeah, this is just a great summary of that sort of getting networking, right? So I'm a big fan of old school networking, getting out to meetups, building with builders. AWS does a lot of um, meetups and so do a lot of other companies. So I, I encourage you to go go to that. Um, you know, if they're a good senior leader in the organization, they're always hiring. So it's a great way to differentiate yourself from the crowd. Um, but as I said, you also can network on LinkedIn so well now. And, you know, I, we're looking at people who engage in conversation. So whether it be on a post actually articulating some really interesting ideas and having a bit of a conversation with the OP, fine. Um, proactively attracting employers, I'm pro proactivity. So I'm going to tell you to put that open to work banner. Um, one thing that we've seen a lot of success with is sometimes having someone who you respect, who's respected in the industry, post on your behalf and say, you know, Mr. X or Miss X is is looking for a job right now. I just want to talk to you about their work ethic and some of the great projects they've done and some of the skills that they have. When we've actually seen that sort of third party endorsement style post, um, a lot of people are getting hired from those kind of posts at the moment. So that's really big at the moment, and and you've probably seen them um, a, a lot in the last six months as well. Um, Targeting companies. So that's where I'm really thinking about your script. Like where you're going, these are the kind of managers I would crawl over broken glass to work with. I'm passionate about working with them. You know, um, I work with an amazing VP called Greg Pearson. I I was just would do anything to work with Greg Pearson, right? So um, I wanted to work in his space. I wanted to learn from him. So um, pick those people and think about what you would say to them, i.e., what are the problems they're solving and how can you help be part of the solution rather than connecting and asking for something, right? So that, it, you know, if we really think about networking as exchanging value, that'll help you. And that's where the customization and the positivity comes in because it might take a few tries and persistence. A lot of good tech, tech talent on the market right now. so. It, it, it might take a few iterations before you're successful um, with networking. And networking is something I talk to a lot of job seekers and most don't do it because it's uncomfortable. So if you want to differentiate yourself from the crowd, this is something that will definitely do that. I think that's it for that. I, and we can move right on to the next slide. All right, let's do some really quick resume basics and interview skills because I want to finish up so we can just dialogue. Um, it's much more fun. Um, 
So let's go into the next slide. I think I said before, you know, this is the thing that um, I think is the most important um, thing is that, that your resume and your LinkedIn align, right? So at the moment, what is really great is if you keep it simple. Um, and apart from what I've already got on the screen, make sure you have your social media links clearly signposted because um, they've done resume eye tracking studies and the average recruiter will spend maybe 10 seconds on your resume um, at first. So they're just looking, and the eye tracking studies have shown they go to your most recent job. So you want to put your most exciting key skills, certifications, or recent job first, whatever's the most important thing. Um, they'll look at your location and, and they'll look at your name. You know, that that's what the eye tracking studies show. Um, so it's a very quick search in the initial one, like really fast. Um, and then if they see something in those keywords that we referenced before, they're going to go back and do a deeper dive. And that's when they're going to look at your CV or resume more holistically. So that's why if, if that's happening, then you don't need pictures, graphics, uh, you know, all of those things actually for larger companies, um, they don't really show up well in our system. So they'll often come as an error um, or impact the font or and just make it hard for those eyes to follow your, your key impact. So just keep it simple. Um, I actually I actually think if you you don't need to have an objective or summary statement if you've got tons of experience, but if you don't, this is when this summary statement or objective can just show the recruiter what you want. So keeping it simple is also about just what do you want to do? Um, and sometimes we just see people making these summary statements that are so broad and generic that it's hard to tell that they're trying to position themselves here or here. And this is where I like to have a discussion on customized resumes. Sometimes you have a strong general resume and you'll just finesse it and change certain basics of it as you submit to different roles. You should be doing that. You should be customizing your resume to highlight the parts of your experience that most match the job description that you've just read. So you're trying to highlight, oh, I've got that and that, and this is when I've done it. So if you're not changing it, that's spam resume, right? So it, it should be customized as you go to certain um, job descriptions and you want to shape the story to solving the problem that that organization has, right? Your first job is, I can solve that problem. I can fill that gap. Um, we're skills and keyword based now. So everything around certifications, education and skills is particularly critical if you're just starting out in, in industry. Um, and obviously reverse chronological order is generally preferred. But as I said, I'm being very subjective. So um, these are just some quick tips. Most important thing is accomplishments. I'm a pro accomplishment person. And I believe that every single person, um, no matter what your job was, can put a very short statement of what you did. And then a separate area where you quantify your achievements, where you can really use data to show the value that you added. You can estimate that data. You can find statements that illustrate the impact of what you've done, whether it be an award you won or specific data on how it improved cost, saved time, saved money, added value to a customer, even if it was a simulated project. You can quantify that. I think you can estimate that. And I think that's really, really important. And that will distinguish you from the crowd because also many don't quantify their achievements and any tech company is very data-driven. So there's sort of some quick basics about the CV. Um, I'm going to pause there because this is also a good one for questions. Yeah, Miss, I completely agree to what you just said. And yeah, there are some questions which are like, 
one i'll put on the screen which is coming from jaydeep and it says which keyword we could use to help our profile get more reach when searched see the interesting part is there's a problem in your question because it assumes that there's keywords that are universal to every job right and and that's where i think we need to think about yeah there are certain keywords there are certain technologies that are core so first and foremost it's about your target companies so if you're wanting to be hired by a google or an amazon you, there are key technologies that are common there are key certifications that are common um so you're going to want to highlight those keywords which are going to have more reach um if you're wanting to work for a startup, it's gonna be very different. So I think the first thing you need to do is define what you're looking for. I think it's very hard to say there's a universal keyword that will get the attention of everybody in the market. And that's why some of the things that worry me is that we tend to do our LinkedIn once and leave it, and our CV once and leave it. And I guess my passion today is try customizing it. We're we're problem solving builders, your experimenters, try different tests, do some A B testing and see whether you get through different keywords. Obviously, it's got to be true, but by sort of shaping and highlighting different things, do you get um, better reach? Try that out yourself. But I think it really depends on where you're intending to, to end up. Get it. Yeah, there's no universal keywords and if it was like everyone would fall in into that umbrella so so how you differentiate there <laughs> but let's let's take aws as an example if i want to be a solution architect now we know a solution architect there's probably 13 different type of <laughs> mm -hmm. it's the most broad thing it's like there's no one solution architect you can be a partner sa you can be however there's some core general essay stuff go and read the essay job description in a couple of markets read one that's advertised in the uk the us and australia that's just a great example find the keywords that they're most repeating and you'll see what the basic qualifications desirable qualifications are from an aws perspective and that's what they you're going to want to reflect in your keywords but you're going to it's going to have to be true and you're gonna to wanna to see it in certifications, which is why that's not just the job description is the clue to what skills you need, but also that your keyword search. If AWS is your target co company, right? So it really depends on, on what your target, but that would be how I would do it. Um, and if I was really industrious, I would then go and go, okay, well, what does it look like at the other companies I'm targeting? And is there a, a kind of commonality that I can pitch myself to the market? Yeah. That completely makes sense. Now I'm going to take one more question from audience. It is a very long winded question. Yeah, but I, I, I feel the pain here, what he's trying to say, Chris. So the last two or three places I worked, I have in B2B with quite significant problem to solve. Have you mm. any advice for demonstrating one value to an enterprise without compromising their privacy or highlighting the issue they were having? That's such a good question. Um. I think the advice, I'm going to kick in, but I think I need to um, phone a friend on this one. I think you might be able to help me um, as well with this one. Um, that is a problem, especially like, a, you know, if people are working in sort of government or public sector sometimes, it can be really difficult. I still think that we go back to maybe the, the scale of it. So if, if you think about the problem, like what problem you solved, you can always extrapolate the, the non-confidential elements. It, it will possibly make it more generic, but that's okay. But then you can always quantify an impact in terms of able to save time, cost, or improve revenue. There's always a, an upside in those three areas. So I don't think any of those would compromise the identity of a customer. So I think I would just focus on those big ticket benefits um but i think this is also more of a problem for the interview as well if you if there are certain things you can and cannot say um so i think it, it would create that my tip to you is to do more homework on writing down the great work you did and then just editing out the things that can't be shared because for sure there's some things that you can share 
Yeah, means quantification can always be in terms of time you saved or revenue generated or the more profit you bought to business or could be you solve the problem of manpower or whatever. But yeah, maybe a little generic, but still data would not be not data can be still there, but maybe not the specific information can be can be there. Correct. So I think what you need to do is find the data that um, yeah de-identifies the specific customer so that as long as it could be oh they that could be 16 different fsi companies i i don't necessarily think it's this fsi if you can extrapolate that enough the problem with that and that's the the the, the kind of trade-off is that it will make your answer more slightly more generic now, in the same line, I, I have a question. Like, if if I have my com company listed on LinkedIn as confidential, how how recruiters see it? <laughs> yeah, very few people have. I don't think I've ever seen a, someone list their company as confidential. I'm sure someone has. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's a little yeah. odd nowadays. But yeah, it, it I've seen some of these profiles like that. Yeah. Yeah, um, I would have to say that that is going to make them less searchable, right? So that's, again, the trade-off. Um, and I think if it really is that confidential, you're in a very specific space. And so your way of being searchable is probably not LinkedIn. You're probably going to have to go through offline secret squirrel networking ish. -ish. You're going <laughs> to, you know, you're going to have to do that. Um, I, it's it's funny though. I do think there is something whereby, as a back end searcher, you if you put in certain keywords, those people will still come up, right? Um, and it's not an absolute rule out, but I I have seen what I call we call them in the biz skeleton profiles because <laughs> ideally I want the opposite. I don't want a skeleton profile. I want as much information as I can get. So sometimes I'll look at a skeleton profile and bypass it, but other times I'll be like. There's something there I need to dig, um, so we'll follow up. But but obviously there's the, the the challenge with selecting those highly confidential jobs. They're probably super exciting, but it will possibly make it harder for you to be more visible um, and searchable. So you're going to have to probably be more proactive in your reach outs and networking. Get your point. Yeah, it means CIA won't be recruiting spies from LinkedIn, isn't it? <laughs> I, I would love that. Can someone watch this and 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 ask me to recruit spies? Because I would really love to take up that challenge. Because I have no idea where I would start. Um, you know, I'd probably leave some secret messages at the you know the local yeah. supermarket for us to yes. to meet. Spy craft. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Thank you. All right. So we'll we'll keep moving forward. If you want to move to next slide, Liz. Yeah. Let's move on. So I'm going to move fairly quickly through the next few slides because I want to finish up and just have a chat. Um, so next one. All right, the virtual interview. It's it's really interesting. Um, I, I mean, really basic stuff here, and I'm assuming you all know this, but it's fascinating even when you know we don't do it. Um, I'm breaking one of my own rules today. I'm not wearing a headset. I think it's so good to have a headset so that you have don't have sound issues. Um, really, like, like, so, like, it's really dark for me. So I've got my selfie light on today, right, so that you can see me um, because I have seen um, what I like to call a spy interview where the lighting is really bad and you can barely see the person. So all of those basics are just going to make you more confident. The biggest thing that I see now is people are, and especially in people who are maybe in the first five years of their career, I'm seeing a lot of reading notes on their examples. Actually, I would say I see that a lot. And it's difficult because I know that you need to know your background. However, it takes away from the experience of really connecting to the interviewer and selling yourself. So um, I have really seen a lot of people looking down like this to, um, you know, to read. So um, my advice is really straightforward. Make sure it's in your field of vision. You can get a stand and have your notes up there if you need to sort of glance to the right and then glance back to the person 
just to remind yourself of a few of your cheat sheet bullet points that you're using for examples, fine, no problem whatsoever. Um, so that's a big one for the basics. Um, and although it's hard, I really prefer an in-person interview because you can match, mirror, you can build rapport so much better. Um, but we're all virtual nowadays, so I still think there's a real art form to kind of mirroring their body language and their, their you know, to really sort of reading the room. So sometimes you're so focused as a candidate on how you feel that you forget to just connect with that person. Remember, your job is not to be perfect or to give perfect answers, although you think it is. Your job is to just take a deep breath, connect with that person and think, how can I solve a problem for them? What is the problem that person needs solved? And how do I fill that gap? If you come in with that mindset, I think you will do so much better, even if you don't share your examples perfectly, even if you do leave out some important data, you've, you've done something more important um, than that. But the fun thing about the interview, I see experienced people make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes in their interview. It's what makes us human. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I love this one. Be comfortable and don't fidget because you can see me doing it now. I'm very expressive with my hands. So I sometimes have to sit on my hands when I'm doing interviews. So I'm not that expressive because I don't want to distract candidates. Um, we can look at the next slide as well. This is this diamond. We have a great diamond analogy, analogy for the star. Everyone's heard about star, which is situation, task, action, result. Um, uh, and we can go to the next slide again. But um, it, I, this is the funniest thing about the star method, right? Um, is everyone knows and very rarely is it used. So every single time I'm interviewing, I'm mentally going, what was the situation they clarified? What was the task? What was the action? What was the result? And when I'm doing that, whatever you miss in your answer is going to be my probing follow-up question. Um, so I'm always looking for that situation, task, action, result-based answer. Everybody is. And keeping to the structure at first is really important. And then as you get more confident, you can kind of maybe wing it a little bit. The, the thing that I would suggest that you do is get a piece of paper and figure out your 10 best examples of your career so far and write down on that paper, S-T-A-R, right? Really simple and write the situation in a line, the task in a line, the key action in one or two lines, and then the key result. Super sharp, super short, super high level. That's your cheat sheet. If you can't write that or you don't know that, you haven't prepared enough and you're not ready. And I always say, if you're interviewing in a lot of companies, you probably need 10 good examples. Um, so if you're winging it on going, oh, yeah, I'll just do star in the moment, it never works. And it's and the lack of preparation really shows. We like to talk about. Um, once you've done those things, the cut of your story to the appropriate length. Again, subjective recruiter advice here, but what I like to do is say, do a shorter version of your star, and then if they miss anything, they can do follow-up questions. Because sometimes what happens if you try to give every piece of information, the story gets so convoluted, we can't follow your train of thought. So I go with those short, sharp, concise, but I'm an Amazonian and we like concise. So you may need to think about the company and read the room when you're cutting your story to the appropriate length. Make sure your answers are colorful and exciting. Tell the story, paint the picture of this pain. This was the pain point, right? What was the task I had to do is the biggest thing everyone misses. Everyone tells me a lot about the situation, but telling me what your role in, in navigating the solution is often missing. So make that clear. My role was to own X. I owned this work stream. My part was to deep dive into the root cause of Z. Um, but, but tell us about just two or three really interesting actions that you took to solve the problem that you're describing in your star. Um, you don't have to tell me everything. 
And then the result, it goes double for those quantitative and qualitative answers. We're looking for data, data, data. Um, even in simulated projects, you should have some data. So what did that do? How did it save time? What did it mean from a customer experience? How did, if you couldn't quantify it with data, can you can you use qualitative data in terms of feedback or surveying or 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 manager inputs? Um, so that's that's the most important thing, and we call that the carrot. Um, and that's only then will you be ready with your perfect diamond, with your cut, your color, your clarity of following the format, your weight of data, 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 data. Um, Will you be ready for the big proposal? <laughs> this is so corny, but I love it. <laughs> and I think that that's pretty much the end of our slides now. We're done. Basic tips, you'll see them anywhere. There's nothing new. You just got to do it. Yeah, I mean, so I like <laughs> the analogy of star. It's completely, completely makes sense. Like you have a rough diamond, sharp it, like polish it, and then present what is required. That That's an interesting one. Thank you so much. I'm going to give you one more tip for free, right? Because two things to say, and then I'm, I'm done. And, and, you know, I don't know if there are any questions or we wrap up here. But um, the STAR method comes from adult learning theory. It was like universities saying, how do we know students know what they know? How do we know that they really learned? The STAR method was introduced as a learning theory to say, that we really, really can validate they've really learned what we needed them to learn um, in their tertiary education. And that's why it's so powerful because it's, it's about saying, how do we know you can do what you say you can do? And that's why it's so widely used as a behavioral interviewing technique. And so in the interest and spirit of adult learning theory, a little extra thing. So situation, task, action, result, Add another R to that, which is reflection. And reflection is, if I had the same example again, what would I do differently? If you proactively add in an example how you're learning from that example and oh, I think I could have done this better and next time I'll do this or even better, you've applied the learning to a future situation after that example, that makes you the best candidate in the world, in my opinion, because that makes you completely learn and be curious. It, it makes you a, a, the, the candidate that learns from their mistakes and is um, able to be humble and vocally self-critical enough to share it and earn my trust. So I think just that's a personal one and it's subjective, but I also think that talking to my recruiting and, and hiring manager peers in multiple companies, they really value that extra adding of perspective and reflection. And as people potentially early in your career, switching careers, you can provide that reflection to them. And that will, um, again, make you stand out from the crowd. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Obviously, that would be really value add to whatever you are saying. And that gives the same thing, like you said, learn and be curious. Okay, it's not mm -hmm. like just I completed, but I learned from it and I am trying to apply this into next project. So that's interesting. Exactly. And the hiring manager will say, well, maybe that that wasn't the right solution they should have chosen, but they, they, they got it. They realized their mistake. And I, as a manager, can work with that because that means they're coachable. We, yeah. we don't need perfect people, but we need people who are coachable. If they think they know everything and they're not willing to shift, there's not a lot we can do. And that makes you difficult to hire if you're not, if you're not willing to, to learn from your mistakes. Nice. Interesting. That's it. Any That's questions? It. Yeah, so we will we will take some questions from audience. Anyone who has questions, please put them into chat and I'll share on the screen. I, I have one question here, Liz, so I'll, I'll add it on the screen. So let us know like what you think. This is a common question. People are trying to change careers and they may be working in, let's say, automobile and now want to move to cloud. Yeah. How they should position their CV because they, they are new starter in a way. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think what you need to think about is review your experience in the STAR method as you prepare for your interview and apply that to your CV. 
And through that process, you should learn about if you're doing something completely different, is there anything that's transferable, right? So if you're going from a non-tech to a tech, if there's anything around a customer or a user or working backwards or, or building relationships, that's still relevant to, say, a solution architecture career. So highlight those elements of the background, even though it's not the right job, still tease out those things that are transferable into the new job. The other thing is shorten that experience. So if you've got a CV that was designed for a completely different career and it's six pages and it's going through everything and it's going through a lot of detail, you don't need that level of detail because a lot of that will be extraneous data that, that is not relevant to that new career. So do it nice, short, sharp, concise. The next thing is really pump up to the top your skills, learning, micro-credentials, or evidence of experiments, okay? So this is what we will say to, to anyone that's in a batch course. So um, do you have any certifications that you've done in this new career field, especially an AWS certification, hint, hint. Um, do you have any courses that you've done, any quick courses, anything in that new field that could show evidence of learning or transferability. But the most important thing is if you've done a program and you've done some simulated practice projects, they're going to be your headline, right? Because that's the, really the only experience you have. Um, but there might be enough in there just to show, oh, there's something in this person. We can build on that. We can coach through it. So you're going to design your CV. In my opinion, you're going to design your CV differently to highlight more of that piece. The, the ability to learn and be um, curious and agile and, and shows if you have evidence that you're coachable, then I can move you across. That's going to come up to the top of the CV and the, the less relevant experience is going to go down to the bottom, but we're still going to tease out those relevant elements. Makes sense. Good advice. Right. Now, I, I, I have one question of mine and it is about like, hey, I applied for a job. I haven't received anything. Can I still talk to recruiter or hiring manager? Means yeah. I haven't heard back. I applied already. The CV black hole. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is the number one critique against recruiters and the number one use case for AI, <laughs> especially generative AI in recruiting, um, which is not high on the investment list, but we need to be. Um, so, you know, we desperately need it because we have all this, these, data lakes dying for some AI to help us surface CVs because they get lost. Um, so you can help us out, right? Typically, you can, again, put yourself in the shoes of the recruiter and hiring manager, manager and think of what problem they're trying to solve and how overwhelmed they are with so many CVs and think, how can I stand out? So absolutely, it's really good to be able to figure out who the recruiter or the hiring manager or the hiring team is. And, and to build that relationship. My advice, though, is that you probably need to start digging the well before you need the water. So if they're posting the job ad and you didn't get a call back, it might, not, it, it might be because they're overloaded and haven't seen your CV, or it might be that your CV doesn't have as much strength as maybe some of the other applicants. And so it, digging the well before you need the water is an important line that I use to say, you might have needed if you're transitioning into a new kit, career to reach out to that before they've posted the role, to have already pre-built that relationship, to have already socialized yourself a little bit with your target hiring managers. That's why that online and offline networking is so, so very important. But there have been many times when I've been recruiting and someone has phoned me because no one phones anyone anymore. It's uncomfortable. People like text. And they phone me out of the blue and it's been inconvenient. But then I've gone, oh my gosh, this is an amazing candidate and I missed their CV completely and I need to pull them in. So mm -hmm. it is worth doing, but be careful about being pushy, aggressive or spam. Like, So sometimes it's just like, I've actually had people say, get me a job or you need to talk to me rather than actually going, yeah, they have, rather than going, Hey, Liz, I see you have that role. I have applied. I know you have it. I know you must be busy with lots of CVs. Here's why I think I'm worth five-minute call with you. Or here's why I think I can add value. 
or I might not be right for this, but I'd like to build a long-term relationship with you where you can keep me in mind for future. And then I've come back to those people again and again. So it's the people that that use EQ that really think before they, they reach out that I want to go out of my way to help. And I think hiring managers are the same, right? The other big one is, it, you know, if it's a tech job, get to the meetup because all the people from those teams are doing meetups and physical things now all the time. So, and, and if you, you can actually just drop it into the convo, by the way, I put my CV in, they're not hiring events, those meetups, but they can be a, a, an incidental hiring boost to you. So that's another tip to, to, to just be a bit different is to, to, if you can, I know it's not always easy physically get in front of people. Invaluable advice. I agree on that. Uh, I'll take two questions. Uh, Liz, they are a little long, but yeah, they're relevant. So, so I'll let you read it, and then we can move forward from them. Yeah. Okay. So I see the question is like, okay, I I want to get into DevOps. So this is a common problem, um, right? And the challenge inherent in this is everyone wants to get into DevOps and but they don't have enough experience and it's a vicious cycle. Um, I, there's two really simple answers, but you might not like the answer. The first is go get a cloud foundation role and get a role with, you know, this is what I tell people from an AWS standpoint, but there are lots of companies out there, go work with a partner or a customer and get some experience under your belt. We have some great, um, our support area, um, networking, troubleshooting, getting onto the basics, they're fantastic. They often move, they start there, do one or two years, then move into a DevOps role. So, so I think it means you might have to do some chess moves first and get some experience under your belt. So um, I think we have to calibrate our expectations to thinking longer term and go, okay, I'm going to do one or two years because that's my stepping stone into DevOps, right? So we need to really kind of calibrate our expectations there. But the second thing is, um, what are you doing? At, you know, I've seen some amazing things from like Restart Cruise. I don't know if you're familiar with Restart here. Like people that are doing 13-week courses and they're doing the course and they want to go into DevOps. But then while they're doing that course, they've gone and done their own six-week agile sprint on a DevOps problem solve. And they've, you know, built their own kind of, hardware and software solutions and apps and done all this cool stuff they're doing all this stuff on the side all the time and they're, they're not doing it for a job they're just doing it as an experiment or a personal passion project i have seen that also open doors into sort of a much more entry-level devops role that then's led led on to some some career so so you're gonna have to have something to show to solve the problem so if you haven't got the experience, you're going to have to show how you've done it offline or in your own time. Um, but generally, I think my first answer is the better one of just take some stepping stones and, and, and set some goals and map out what is the ideal stepping stone, you know, into that, into that ideal career that I'm looking to find. Yep. Ashish, can you have any advice on that? Maybe you've got better tips than me on that one. Uh Means no, no, that that is a logical path, Les. Means whatever you are said, like it's completely logical. If I'm hiring and I feel that hey, person is good developer, but not very specifically DevOps, then then I would look mm. for that profile at very last stage. If I'm not finding anyone, I won't be directly looking into that. So yeah. those stepping stone or at least giving me idea, like okay, maybe not developer, not DevOps, but okay, they have a Kubernetes certification, or maybe they have attended a workshop, or they have completed a workshop or something so that would i would look like if i'm i'm interviewing that person yeah nice. and they have they also have a lot of cool internships as well now if you're willing it, it's a, you you might need to take a little bit of a step back right um you know one of the hottest trends is sort of um later in life or career switching internships right that's a that's a whole thing why not if it if it if it gets you to your passion um sometimes you have to take a risk yeah i agree the, the saying says that you have to sometimes step back if you want to jump very forward so yeah that's the same yeah. thing <laughs> i'll take one more question here 
and then I'll, I'll then have my final question. So what I noticed that I have got engaging conversation with recruiter. It felt like I'm getting my interview schedule with hiring manager. However, it never happened. Any clue why? Any advice? So interesting. It's hard. I, I can't pinpoint, right? Obviously, I'm not going to know that scenario, that situation. It could be many things. It could be that they really liked you and was like, this is a great person. But at the end of the day, I've got these key core skills that I have to hire for. And there might have been other candidates in the mix that had a closer fit to the job description. And so they progressed with those candidates. Um, I'm hoping the recruiter was at least nice to you. Um, it sounds like they weren't because really the recruiter should come back. So my first thing would would be, I would say, hey, I just, you know, I really felt we had a connection. I was really hoping to meet the hiring manager. Was was there any reasonable feedback you can give me on why I didn't progress to my interview? Um, I, I would ask that question of my recruiter. Um, you know, it's happened to me in the past. And I was like, that, and, and it was really interesting because it was like, oh, yeah, you're definitely going forward. And then I just didn't hear anything. And I kept saying, oh, is, is it happening? Is it happening? Oh, no, no, they're just busy. But then, you know, the other thing that can sometimes happen is is hiring manager priorities change or they shift headcount or someone moves internally and then they no longer have mm -hmm. that recruitment. This happens a lot too. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's personal to you. Um, that said, it's still really disappointing and frustrating. But my advice is to, to be bold and to ask why and to think of a long-term relationship. So I might even find out who the hiring manager is because I'm a bold girl. And I'd write them and say, I was really excited about this job. I wasn't able to come to you um, this time, but I'd like to keep in touch with you because you're you're someone I really want to work with. And, and here's why I think it would be valuable connecting with me, right? Here's what I can offer you. I can solve this problem for you in the future. Um, and I would, you know, I've done that. You know, I've definitely done that in my first boss at Amazon. I reached out to them. And said, I've, I, I said, I've always respected them. I knew them from when I was in Singapore because I lived all over the world. And, and I said, I'm coming back to Asia from Europe. You know, I'd love to work in your team. And this is what I can offer you if you have anything open. And that's how I got my job at Amazon, um, you know, because I, I just showed respect and how I could solve the problem. So I think it's worth being proactive. But just remember, you may not, you may experience that rejection that the hiring manager might not want to engage with you or you might not progress, but it's still worthy for you to keep practicing that skill set of going after what you want, asking questions, trying to get as much feedback as you can. Yeah, feedback is important. Thank you, Liz. Now, I, I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to ask final question, and sure. that's from my side. And that is of is there any something like cool off period or previous interview history impact? Are you speaking for AWS or just yeah. generally? Yeah, uh, is I mean, AWS specific like because a lot of people say, hey, I applied six months is not there. Should I apply again or I failed one interview? What impact it would have? Yeah. Um, we hire people who fail interviews and succeed second, third, fourth, fifth time around all the time. And same happens at Google. Like it's it's tough to to join these companies. We have a high bar. Um, so I think everyone loves to, to, we, to kind of revisit candidates. We have a whole um, section on sourcing revisit candidates from the past that kind of maybe got to onsite and did a good job but didn't quite cross the line hey let's revisit that candidate right so absolutely the timing varies and it will vary on your experience and sometimes you know the feedback will be let's revisit that person in six months so six months tends to be the general feedback i hear at amazon like yeah six to twelve months let's bring them back in Let's keep in touch that 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 person's worth revisiting. And what that usually means is that in that six to 12 months, you might just get a little bit more depth of experience or a little bit more breadth of tech experience that can round you out for the role that we are recruiting for. And and we can keep in touch in case something else comes off. So I, there is not an absolute cool off period like that. Oh, it must be. Um, you know, that's enforced like a legality. 
I think it's, I think it's um, high value judgment, which we prize so highly here at Amazon is just like, yeah, just think maybe we'll keep in touch with that person. They might need this, just a little bit more skills. They might need a certification here or, or um, often with a solution architecture, it's, they often need more customer experience. And that's the challenge is they've got the tech side potentially, but they, they don't have as much exposure to the customer. And so we're so customer driven, we need that or, or they might not have the, the you know, we look for te tech depth and breadth, right? So there might be some balancing out that needs to happen. So that can be six, 12 months. Sometimes it might be a little longer. Sometimes it might be shorter. So hard to say. Um, in terms of previous interview history impact, it, it really depends. Like, you know, I would say for the, for the most part, we revisit a lot of candidates. Um, you know, people do get better interviewing as a skill and they might not have yeah. shown themselves in the best light. So I don't think that we're in any way punitive. We're absolutely happy to revisit. But there might be some situations where it's just not a fit for both sides, where we think, you know, it's probably not worth revisiting from a culture standpoint. And they might, you know, there's a, a role for everyone. They might be more suited to a culture at an, another organization. Absolutely answers the question. So I, I'll stop here. We are already over time and I know it's very late for you. It's very really <laughs> late for you. It's 1, 2 p.m. now, 2 a.m. I think right now, 2, 2 15, 2 30 for you. So, right. but thank you so much, Liz. It was so, so interesting and inspiring plus informative to know about all the stuff. And these like some, some small tips. Uh, you never know like who would get benefited by one small tip you have shared. So so I hope people would be appreciating your time and will be working on the things and probably you have more LinkedIn followers now. So so Well, I have a challenge. Like practice what I've taught you and you should all be connecting with me on LinkedIn, right? Come and pitch to me, practice on me. Um <laughs> happy to be the guinea pig for for your reach out. That's so nice of you. Thank you, Liz, Thanks and we hope to have you again and enjoy your time and have a good weekend. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Ashish. Bye. Bye. Uh, Besa participant, we will take a short five minute break and then we'll have Jamila and Kasip with us who will talk about startup. But hope you have got a lot of insight. And if you have any questions, comments, uh, keep them coming. Uh, we are collecting feedback for the next sessions also. So we'll talk to you in five minutes. So let me add the screen of timer and then we will start again five minutes and we start again thank you <laughs>